Welcome back to the Photo Banter Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Gagne, and on today's podcast, I welcome back returning guest, photographer and director, Greg Hunt. Greg has a new book out titled, Everything I'm Trying to Tell You, a collection of photographs from over 20 years of not only skateboarders, his travels, but also some very personal images of his children and family. In this interview, I speak to Greg about how he approached editing this book, what he enjoys about photography, and how he used it as a tool to get through tough times this past year. Greg is someone whose work I've respected for many years, so I was excited to have a chance to speak with him again about his new book. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode, and if you're interested in getting a copy of Greg's book, it's available for purchase now at superlabo.com. I'll put the link in the description, um, but highly recommend picking up the book. Um, I got a copy myself last week, and uh, really amazing images and qu quality printing, so definitely go pick up a copy if you're interested, and uh, yeah, hope you guys enjoy. All right, well, uh, welcome back, Greg Hunt, second time on the show. Excited to have you yeah. back, Greg. You got a new book. Uh, everything i'm trying to tell you just came out uh great book which you can get uh i got it at super labo the publisher in japan but i think uh some other places have it now too right yeah uh lang books has it in san diego i, I think it's going out to different bookshops but i know lang has a few copies left and um and then i'm gonna have a show uh at uh, baltimore photo space do you know kyle miles Oh, I never met him, but I know of him, and uh, I definitely want to interview him at some point because uh, he's got a cool little photo uh, bookstore kind of yeah. down in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. So he's going to do an exhibit of the work there? Uh, it's not going to be an exhibit. It's going to be like a, a signing, and then we're going to have a slideshow where I'll do a little talk, and then we're going to make some posters. And That's cool. It's, it's basically a signing, but I don't know. We were talking about it and try to make it into something more than just a table with a pen. You know? I think you, you just had a recent like artist talk out there in LA, mm -hmm. right? How, yeah, how, I, I like how is, that. Yeah, how What's is that? that? How is that like talking about your work and presenting it? Is this something you enjoy uh, or? Well, you know, it's funny because um, I don't know. I'm a skateboarder and uh, I hate talking in front of people and having to present things. Like if it's like having to speak at a wedding or something, I'm like, I hate it. I'm like terrified. Yep. you know nervous but uh for whatever reason when i'm like talking about pictures and my pictures especially with a group of people who are sort of i guess like-minded mm -hmm. if that makes sense yeah uh i really enjoy it like i don't get nervous at all you know it's like really easy for me mm. so um yeah and i think like especially these days i like the idea of just kind of whatever interaction you can get if people are going to come out, I feel like it's beneficial, you know, um, just because of whatever social media and stuff. It's like really awesome to have a slideshow and be sitting in a room full of people just talking about the pictures, talking about the experience and what went, in, went into the book. I mean, that's something you just can't. There's something about doing it in person that's so different than if that were to be like the same video online you know what i mean just talking about the pictures it's it's just a totally different experience and uh the couple times i've done it i just feel like i really enjoy it and the people that are there really enjoy it too it's almost like i don't want to say uh, unexpected but it's just a nice thing to do these days maybe coming out of the last few years too where there wasn't as many kind of like yeah gatherings or whatever it's 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 and, nice to do so and i'd imagine it's got to be interesting because they're your photographs i think what it's about 20 years of photos in this book right yeah so when i was working on that book specifically towards the end i stored well I'll, I'll tell you the story about sort of what that book how that book came to be and that's sort of what the slide this slideshow is i did one at lang and i'm gonna do one at um baltimore photo space on june 3rd but it's like I, it's it's a good book to do a presentation, I guess, if you want to call it like that, or a talk about, because the more that I worked on that book, the more it changed and the more it, it got kind of scaled back. And then at the, at the, towards the very end, I even took out, I had an index, which kind of broke down who's in the photos, where, and what date, which is something I, so, you know, I always do just sort of instinctively. Uh, and, um, um, uh, I just took that out, you know, like I just felt like I looked at it and um, I was like, I don't really want 
like it's because it, it turned into a much more personal book where there's their kids and there's a picture of my mom in the hospital, but then there's pictures of Dylan Reader and it's like putting all those names in a list. It just seemed appropriate if someone, because I, I do like it when I'm looking at a book to say like, oh, who is that? And you go to the index and be like, oh, that's so-and-so. Wow, that was 2005. But for this book, I was like, no, fuck it. I just want it to be just the pictures. And especially once that title kind of came to be, mm -hmm. I was like, I think the concept of this book is just totally sort of an expression of how I feel about things and my life at this point in time through images only. And it doesn't matter who it is or when it was, it's really about the images. And that's something I've never done. So when I kind of got to that point, I was thinking like, man, I, at some point in time, I should talk about like, it'd be good to talk about this book because if you were just to look at the book itself, it doesn't, it's open for interpretation. So I think kind of that's, giving that's, that my own, my own perspective on it, I think might be interesting to people. You know? that, that's what I kind of like about it. Cause uh, <laughs> I, I have a pet peeve sometimes with like, uh, especially like photo shows, if you go to like a gallery or something and they'll have like, sometimes artists will have like a description of the project and it'll be like, it's like they wrote a book for the thing, which I understand. Yeah. But I kind of yeah. like this going into it blind because it's like it. these are your photos, of your life. But I even as looking at it myself, there's like a lot of stuff that I can kind of like resonate with coming from skateboarding or yeah. even some of the family stuff. Like, mm -hmm. how has it been the response from the book? Is there anything that's kind of surprised you like people's kind of reaction to the photos or anything like that? Um, not I mean, nothing's really like surprised me. I guess what surprised me is I've never put my kids in a book. I've never put my family in a book. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the books I've done, I'm not really like a a uh, a photographer in terms of like, you know, a, a, a photo journalist or a photographer who always makes books. My books come from like a much more personal place. But then the last two books I've I've done have been very specific, you know, like uh 17 years of jason dill or my first role of my first roles of photos I ever shot it's like a pretty straightforward concept and this became a lot more personal and um uh yeah so i was just i didn't know what people were going to think putting pictures of my kid mixing pictures of my kids and my family and personal things and in with um uh, with stuff that maybe a lot of people are more familiar with but i what surprised me is that i feel like the more uh the photos that are kind of more personal uh i think got the strongest reaction you know yeah for me i just the, didn't know what people would think so yeah for me the two pictures that kind of stuck out to me more than anything were the there's a picture i'm guessing it's probably a family member in the hospital and mm -hmm. then there's like some other um pictures of like a dresser with like it look like family photos and things like that yeah um, have well, you so, always been some someone that like photographs their family a lot i do and you know i've only like you know i've always said like i started shooting photos first before i started filmmaking got into filmmaking photos photography is kind of what got me into filmmaking mm. uh, and um and then once i started doing making especially in the early on with skate videos they're fun and they're it is self-expression to a degree but it's also not personal it's really those films are they're about the people in the video that's the way i look at them they're not my own mm -hmm. personal kind of like creation it's a collaboration you know so having the pictures having photography has always been very important for me because um a lot of times I'm working on these video projects where there's sometimes not a lot of my personal, you know, it's not personal for me. It's a job, you know? Mm -hmm. So having photography, whether I'm visiting family or whether I'm on a road trip or whatever, you know, and this was especially in the, like the two thousands where it's still, I was shooting all film. I could come home and like, I, I didn't have to do anything with those photos. You know, I could go on a four week long skate trip or I could go, do whatever. And, and I could, you know, I really, it was nice to have something where there was no expectation for the work. I didn't, I could do whatever I wanted with it. So yeah, I've always shot um, personal work and it's just cause I like to take pictures. It was never, there was never an intention to show a lot of that work. Like, you know, a lot of the pictures in that book, there was no intention ever to like show it. I just took the pictures because I like taking pictures because it provides a nice balance, you know, in my life. Yeah. So, um, 
And but this was, is the first time I've, I've incorporated that into something else. No, it, it was great work. And the title, uh, everything uh, I'm trying to tell you, how did that kind of title come about? And like, what, what does it kind of mean to you, I guess? Um, well, so I'll step back and say, like, originally this book was 20 Years of Color. And it was going to be called 21st Century Color. Mm hmm and um because i've shot a lot of color but i've never really done much with it and then i did 20th century summer which is my very first pictures so when i was finishing that book with jason lee i had this idea man i should you know it'd be cool to do a bookend to this and you know make a book called 21st century color and that's like you know so i'd have my first a book of like my very first rolls of film i shot and then a roll of kind of color work I've done in this last 20 years, but a lot more new stuff, you know? And um, so that was originally my concept. And that was what I was working on for, I don't know, maybe six months or something like that. I was starting to pull pictures and shoot a little bit and kind of like think about it. I talked to, to Yasunori at Super Labo about wanting to do this book. <clears throat> and then actually a year ago, yesterday, May 16th, um, 2022, my mom uh, was hit by a car riding her bike Jeez. and um, I that completely just changed everything uh, I'm her only biological kid so I just flew out there that day she was in Arizona uh, she was in the ICU for three weeks then she was in multiple hospitals over the summer um, neuro neuro rehab hospitals and things like that and um, so I started going to Arizona all the time um, and at the same time, uh, this gets personal, but it's fine because that's what the book about, is about. So I'm fine talking about it. At the same time, I was separating from the mother of my kids. So that was, there was a lot, you know, it was an amicable separation, but, you know, it's moving and it's with young children and kind of wanting to kind of do it right for them. So that was a, those two things were happening at the same time. Um, so I, ha I, I, I had these sort of now, blocks of time week week on week off with my children uh without getting into more specifics mm -hmm. so i had these like weeks off a week off you know every other week where i would just go and visit my mom and that sort of became my life for i don't know i would say four months or something like that you know and i started driving out there and i started kind of just planning these i started taking pictures on the drives and then I started kind of giving myself a day or two before or a day or two after where I would basically just go get lost, you know, like I would have sort of a place that I knew I wanted to stay in a hotel, but I would just kind of go to these towns, not even towns sometimes, just like I was really drawn to these abandoned places for whatever reason and like empty houses, you know, how you see those sometimes, like mm -hmm. those houses you can just walk into and there's still plates and dishes and things like yeah. that. I found myself really drawn to that. And I just started taking pictures of a lot of that stuff. And that's something I had never really done before. I mean, I think it was, um, it was, it was because I had the time for the first time in a long time, but also because I don't know, I think I was processing everything that was happening with my life and photography became this almost like therapeutic process for me. And uh, I also started driving up, kind of north into Bakersfield and doing these little if I wasn't seeing my mom I would just kind of go drive and get lost you know and um, yeah so it was a mix of things kind of just not knowing what to do and needing to do something and photography being this really perfect kind of yeah way for yeah. me to, to do it so this is a long answer but um, then the book totally changed you know, it was no, I knew it was no longer going to be 21st century color. Um, that's where I like that. And if you look at the flow of the book, you know, I did it intentionally where there's sort of these kind of, you know, there's like Jake Johnson and there's a picture of Mark Gonzalez's feet. And then there's sort of more kind of my older work. And then all of a sudden there's this dust storm on the road, you know, and that was one of those times where I would just, I was totally in the middle of nowhere. And I turned around, there was like a dust storm. And then the next page is my mom in the hospital. And that's and, kind of when the book changes, you know, and then there's my son. 
and then it gets a lot more personal. So it was a really interesting process of like making this book and kind of just being like, fuck it. I'm just going to make the book that feels right. Mm -hmm. I don't even care what it's about. You know, it doesn't matter if it has some sort of like conceptually, you know, is about some certain thing, you know, which is sort of what I've done in the past. Like, I'm just going to make a, it just, it's the only thing I could do when I made that book is like, it's just got to be a book of pictures that sort of express how I feel at this time, you know? And then that's where the title came from, you know, like there was a few different titles that was bouncing around, but that one, once it landed was like, okay, you know, and then messing around with just how that title was going to kind of look on the page, you know, it kind of came up with where it's basically, if you look at it, it says everything I am. And then it says, I'm trying, you know, and then to tell you. So that, and that's very uh, true to what the book is to me too. Cause I mean, it really, that book is so much of it is everything that I am, especially now. And then um, I'm trying just because last year was just super fucked up. <laughs> I yeah. was just trying I, to like get through it. So I, yeah, I was going to ask you, it's like, is photography always been kind of heavy because it'd be easy like any people who go through tough times um everyone goes through things in life it can be easy to just kind of hole up and like not leave your house and be sad or depressed about whatever's going yeah. on in your life but it, it, have you always kind of used uh photography i guess as a tool or a way to kind of deal with those hard times or you know i feel like in the past photography i wouldn't say it was a shield but, you know, it's interesting. I don't hear a lot of photographers talk about this. But photography, you know, I started shooting pictures when I was a pro skater, amateur skater, and um, on these tours, right? And, um, but I was not a secure person, you know? I was really insecure. And I've socially always been kind of quiet and at least in my adult life, you know, mm. and, um, and not really felt comfortable. I'm not like a, an alpha, you know, and um, looking back at the time, I didn't, I wasn't conscious of it, but looking back, it's really clear to me that photography was like this perfect thing where I could sort of be in the room and hanging out with everybody. But the, the camera was like the shield to where it gave me a purpose for being there. And um, it allowed me to kind of like study people and get close to people without just being like a creep and just sitting there with nothing to do or nothing to say. Mm -hmm. And then also I could kind of leave, come and go. And it felt like, okay, he's obviously going to go take a picture or something else. Even though a lot of times it was just, I didn't have anything to do or say, or yeah, maybe I wanted to go take a picture or something else. But I feel like the camera just gives, I mean, this is obviously prior to smartphones and stuff too, but the camera gave me a really good sort of like purpose in terms of being around groups of people you know what I mean like I could be around Coco Santiago and a lot of these people when I was young and I had this camera so it was like a shield you know mm -hmm. and then even um I noticed like there's a picture I took of my hand I had like um uh, broke my hand along filming and then I had the cast taken off and there's pins and I took this picture of my hand it was in this the mind the mind the book we made for the video minefield like using my camera and taking pictures of things while they're happening even to myself it kind of removes me i noticed like when they're pulling the pin out when i was taking pictures it didn't freak me out because i have this sort of like i'm experiencing it through this other thing it's almost like it it sets you back you know mm -hmm. and um so i feel like photography has almost always been like this kind of shield or this thing that like kind of lets me kind of hang out with people or be around people or be in situations and be more comfortable because I have my camera you know and then yeah. I think this was the first time I've ever used photography in this way where I was actually um, kind of just taking pictures first and then trying to kind of figure out why after if that makes sense and just letting the camera sort of uh kind of lead me around just to kind of uh, I don't know process what was going on or using photography just to try to understand I think what I was going through I think that's the first time that that I've, that's 
in all these years it's the first time that's happened yeah yeah it's tough like uh i've definitely at least for myself uh definitely dealt with like you know depression and stuff sometimes or going through tough times and yeah. i think even like in the last year some stuff and like like not that you're like at least for me not trying to avoid stuff but it's like you got to keep going and that's a for me it's similar like photography having something a project or something and kind of helps you at least for me kind of keep going was it kind of like were you kind of conscious of like you're going through these tough times like having something to work on was kind of helpful for you yeah 100 percent. yeah yeah i was really looking back now that you say that i was very motivated to work on this book and take pictures you know with that said, I had no, I knew that the book was going to be different and I didn't know what it was going to be, but yeah, I really kind of dove in with photo to photo photography at that time and those trips. And I don't know about you, but um, for me, photography has always been, it always comes in waves, always, mm -hmm. you know, like I'll get really into taking pictures and I see pictures everywhere and I have my camera with me and I'm looking at photo books and then I go through periods and I sort of let it, I let things, I let it happen because I think it's natural. I go through periods where I just don't, I'm not as motivated to take pictures, you know, and I'm not really looking at photo books as much. And I might just shoot more on my phone and my kids and stuff. And I'm okay with that. You know? Um, yeah. It's interesting. It's always, I, I'll go through these like, and I can see it when I look in my, um, through my, years of pictures there's like years that are just like chomp where i was just like taking pictures all the time and then there's sometimes some folders which are two or three years where i just wasn't taking pictures as much so um, i feel like that's just part of the creative process because i think like um i think i realized this too it's like because you, you're obviously a hard worker like you've accomplished a lot you do a lot of things and i like guess a photographer because i i can feel like because you always want to be making stuff but you don't want to force it at least that's yeah. what i realized it's because like if you just force it it's just like shit you know like it's yeah. not it's not meaningful and i think at least for me in the last few years like the it, there is like there's lulls like you said and it's like if a project comes up that like you're into then you can dive deep into it but i feel like there's no point of like forcing something if it's not there i mean what i've learned just for myself is when i'm not into it my photos aren't that good yeah <laughs> so it's just like and when i'm really in the zone you know like I, you can just see it like one roll or one day there's just like sometimes like two or three which is i mean you know how it is that's like almost miraculous like really great photos you know and that's just because you're sort of i don't know not to get uh, cosmic or anything but i also feel like it's like a it's like being open to like a, you know, an energy, if you want to say, like sometimes that you just, it's like, there's a, you know, you can call it serendipity or whatever, but mm -hmm. sometimes you're just in the flow, you know what I mean? And you just get in the flow and things kind of just align because you're sort of just in that flow. And then sometimes you're not in the flow. And when you try to like jam yourself back into it, it's just, it's not, it's not, the same. it's not the same. You know, you, I can look, at least I can look through the pictures from that time where I did try to like, for whatever reason, get back into it, but I wasn't, my heart wasn't in it. And I can just see it in the images. It's like, a, I don't know, photography for me, it's, it's like an emotional, it's a feeling, you know, it's like an emotional thing. And um, that's sort of why, I take pictures, you know, it's like you're attracted to like a a moment or a feeling and you want to capture some sort of like feeling, you know, so, mm -hmm. anyway. And when, when you, cause like, what was like the editing process of this book for you? Like, cause it's like tw tw 20 years of pictures. Uh, like, what is that process? Cause it's a lot of pictures to go through. Like, how do you kind of, kind of yeah. narrow, narrow it down? Cause that's a hard thing to do. And like, did you work with an editor or do you just kind of edit yeah. it yourself? No, I, I worked for this this time. I mean, I actually showed the photos to a few people, you know, and um, it's interesting. Every book I've done has been different, you know. So this book, yeah, I showed the book to a few different friends. And then I worked with um, this guy by the name of Ward Long, who does a lot of work with Deadbeat Club and 
he's really um he's who did all the production prep and the color prep on the pictures because that's something that was really important for me with this book was that the images and the colors are are come out exactly right mm -hmm. and i knew that if i just did it on my own and sent a pdf out to japan it's just hard to control that mm -hmm. the, with the process of printing so i knew that like having someone who knew how to bring the most out of the color and then how to do the rgb to cmyk conversion and also help me make proper proofs that i could send to japan so they could have them on on press i knew that that's something i've never done that i that i really in terms of color i've never done that and i wanted to do it um for this and uh so and so that was ward and then ward actually you know he's made books he's worked on lots of books and he it was great because he's not a skateboarder he's a photographer and he's a book total book you know uh guru or nerd or whatever you want to call it just like a lot of us like a lot of us you know yeah. so having his perspective on the images was really interesting because he wasn't like oh jake johnson jason jason dill he was like just looking at the pictures for the pictures you know yeah what was there one thing that you kind of stuck out for you like that he kind of offered his opinion that kind of like maybe a light bulb went off for you that you didn't think about your own work not necessarily you know he wasn't very heavy-handed but every once in a while I'd kind of be like, yeah, and what about this picture? And I'd kind of have this feeling like, hmm. And he'd be like, eh. yeah. And I'd be like, yeah, okay. All right, it's out, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, and uh, so he's, I think he's he's made books too. So he's aware of, you know, how that input, what kind of input is helpful. And I think sometimes, you know, looking back clearly, he sort of let it be my book. But he was really helpful in terms of, the flow of kind of like perspectives as you turn the page, nothing ever feels like repetitive. There's a nice sort of like, you're kind of close. This sounds very, it sounds too uh, simple because it's not that simple, but just, you know, in terms of the images themselves and the framing, just giving it a nice flow. And also the color, like having the color, there's a lot of like flow in the colors. So the book, in terms of the editing, it's sort of a mix of like, there's a story there for sure. Actually, there's there's a bunch of kind of small micro stories put together, you know, and then it's bookended by these two shots of Jake sleeping. So it is like, there is like an arc of a full story. Um, you know, the book really became for me, it's like about, I don't know how else to explain it. It's kind of like about love and loss, you know, like that's what the book is about. I mean, that's sort of what my year was about. And that's sort of the images that I kind of gravitated towards, um, whether they're obvious or not. And with that said, I, it was not, I, I did then start incorporating pictures that weren't so dark. So there's a nice kind of like, you know, you're not down the whole time. Um, yeah. yeah, so it was a mix of that. And then also just kind of, you know, you know how it is. It's like sometimes one picture works really well after the next picture for whatever reason. <laughs> and then sometimes you one picture for whatever reason doesn't work in between two other pictures. So it's a matter of just uh, just going combing through it and going over it and over and over it. I mean, this book, if anything, I just kept pulling stuff out. You know, I mean, it's like 20 years of pictures. And even by the time I got to Ward. I think I only had like 60 pictures or something like that. And then Damn. it ended up, ended up going down to, I think about 45 or 46 pictures. So. And when you look at the photos from like 20 years ago, um, do you feel like your approach to photography has changed much, changed much? Or like when you look at those pictures for 20 years ago, like how do they make you feel? Uh, they make, I mean, well, it's hard to say because those are all, most of those are pictures that I've been sort of seeing. Mm hmm for the last 20 years also so it's not like uh it's a new it's not like i'm on like i'm taking them out of an old dusty box or something you know so yeah um but i mean i will say like i did shoot almost this entire book was shot on the same camera with the same lens you know and i think for this book that's really it was really beneficial you know because there's a pic there's a couple of pictures in there from 2002 and then there's some pictures from 2022 and they're literally shot on the same lens. And um, 
what, what and, for all the gear nerds what camera lens were you using it's a m6 a leica m6 with um a sumicron a 35 sumicron v4 if you want to get like I'm, I'm not that nerdy but i do know because i had to get another one because my first one broke and i wanted to keep the same lens and then i ended up fixing the original one so that original lens is still in action but yeah it's it's the version four. So, you know, it's, I think from the early eighties or something like that, the lens, and you can see it. I mean, and, and Ward and I sort of let it, let it, let it, let it be what it is. There's a lot of vignetting in there. I mean, that lens has a very beautiful quality to it. It's very imperfect. You know, I think it's a really nice mix with the optics. You know, it's like you have, you have this lens, it's like optically very sharp. Mm -hmm. And the color rendition is beautiful, but then it's also not like perfect, especially when it's wide open, you start getting like um, some funky things start happening, especially around the edges, which I, I personally have always really liked. So, um, you know, so that's, that's a nice thing about this book, I, I think. And that's one thing I think it's interesting to take just all the dates uh, and having no index and having no dates, because it's like, I would like to think that if someone looks at this and they have no reference point for how old some of those photos might be that it might all kind of look like it was shot around the same time yeah i couldn't really tell like okay. only, only ones like arto i could tell you look a little younger that was it okay <laughs> that's but yeah. yeah but uh there's no like um i mean this wasn't on purpose but i don't there's no like technology in the book or anything either now that i think of it there's no like giveaway like oh he's on a on like a a blackberry or something like that there's no i don't think there's any um that is the toughest thing with technology one of my things i fucking hate is and i make this mistake if you photograph someone and you can see the outline of outline of their iphone in their pocket like in a <laughs> photo it drives me nuts you yeah. know like i don't know why but this seeing the technology in the pictures for whatever reason it is i mean i i'm sure people have talked this to death but in terms especially if i mean especially when you go on, you know, I, I started shooting pictures on these skateboarding trips or tours, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, in the last 10 years, when you go on these trips, it's just so different taking pictures, you know, because everyone's on their phone, you know, yeah. and it's in terms of being a photographer, it's so much less fun, you know, like I used to just be shooting pictures, portraits constantly. Cause you're in the van, you're out of the van, you're like sitting outside some restaurant, at night, like, you know, all these like opportunities to get these really amazing photos because you're with these really interesting people and you're out in the world and you're traveling. Every day is different. Every environment's different day and night and in hotels and, you know, and now there's everyone's always on their phone, you know, because if they're not skating or if they're not kind of doing what they need to do and that's what we all do, they go to their phone. Yeah. And it's just, it yields like almost no pictures, you know? And I guess you could say like, well, fuck it. That's how things are now. I'm going to take pictures. And I guess that's true. Well, that's sad, it's as, just not that's as interesting. sad as fuck, man. <laughs> I know it's sad. And it's, it's just not as interesting because no one's engaging with each other. It's like, it's like the same picture over and over, you know, yeah. just someone like looking at their phone. So that was just be like some of my favorite photos, like back in the day, like looking at like, like, in, like coming up like in the nineties and stuff, like in like some like, uh, like a slap article or whatever it could be like some team on tour and it was this like because back then they didn't have phones to distract themselves so it was like guys in a van for like an eight hour drive and then they're like shooting fireworks at each other or like going like swimming and you had to like yeah you entertain your you, you guys entertained each other like because there was yeah. no distraction or any of the other bullshit which is like like you said it lends itself more to more to pictures rather than this kind of like looking at your phone for six hours yeah yeah, yeah. i mean times change i don't think we're ever no nah. we're never going back i try to remember the times of like when i didn't have a cell phone i can't remember i mean i kind of remember but not really like mm. it, it, in the grand scheme of things it wasn't even that long ago it's like 15 years ago when the smartphone kind of came yeah. out pretty, pretty much but i don't know yeah man i, I remember uh <laughs> but you know it, it is it is what it is i mean we're talking about how things have changed and yeah things are things are about to get even crazier so it's oh with like, the, all the ai i've been talking yeah. non-stop about ai it is how do you view that in terms of like your uh your film uh like cinematography work is like ai something you're worried about or like what do you think 
AI is something that I've been thinking about a lot lately, purely because I have children that I need to support. Yeah. If I didn't have kids, I'd just be like, well, fuck it. I'll figure something out, you know? <laughs> yep. But, um, I mean, it's, it's real. I mean, and I think if you're trying to kind of like uh, ignore it or think that it's some kind of passing thing, uh, I think that you're going to be putting yourself in a tough spot if you are a working kind of creative person because yep. um, you can see what even these like simple AI generators do now with images and how good the images have gotten in the last six months. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like almost surreal you know and thinking about what it's going to be like in a year or two you know i know i know levi's is already levi's is already doing some ai models and yeah you know i mean i hate to say it but it's like and i'm not like a fashion photographer or an advertising photographer so i'm not i'm not that threatened by this but it's more of just seeing what it could where that could go is scary because it's like yeah why i'm not saying that this is I agree with this, but why would a brand spend a hundred thousand dollars on a shoot, renting a location, hiring models, yep. a car and do all this stuff when you can do it for free instantly. And I, it's so shitty to say that. Right. Yeah. And it's like, I don't think, I think that's really fucking bizarre and wrong. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like, if people can't tell the difference, you know, using humans, to like create certain things or to be in certain things is going to be, it's going to be, I don't know. It's not what it's going to be like vinyl or something. It's going to well, be this like premium kind of like expensive choice. Yeah. Because like you could just, it sounds so far out, but even just yesterday I was at my kid's baseball game and one of the dads, he's an editor and he was showing me, he's freaked out too. And he was showing me, he's deep into it. So he's showing me a lot of the stuff he made the day before on AI, like images he'd created. And he's just like, like, this is like in the last few months, this has gotten I, so much better. You know, here, here's my opinion. Yeah. I think it's going to take out for sure. A lot of jobs in like, I guess in turn in photography, like lifestyle stuff, anything that's kind of like generic that they can just kind of create. But I think there's always going to be a, a lane for like telling real stories Cause like Absolutely. you, cause if you look at the stories you do, cause like, like the, all the work you've been doing lately is like, I really enjoy like the, the piece you did with Lizzie that's on yeah. your website Thanks. and like that type of stuff or like the piece you did with Zion Wright and his family, mm -hmm. I think a year mm -hmm. or two ago or last year, that stuff, you can't AI that. And I no, think, can't. and people, people resonate with like real stories and real people uh more than anything. And I think if you, can can be a good storyteller and find those stories because that's that's like the hardest thing is like finding really good stories and and being able to like articulate those stories in like yeah. a, a powerful way that that's the skill the yeah. technology the technology is one thing but being able to like find a real story and tell that story that's the skill and i think if if we can be sharp at that i think you, there's still always going to be a lane for photography and like uh like making films Totally. I, I totally agree. I think if, you know, I, I was, I actually was like writing a list, like, I was like, okay, what is like going to be really like fucked by all this soon? And what might, what's going to like be okay, you know? And I was like, well, sports are going to be okay. Yep. You know? Yep. And like, um, you know, like I think too, like, yeah, like storytelling real people, there's going to, that's going to be okay. There's going to be, you know, a need for that. And, um, editing, you know, like, I don't know, you know, like, I think, ha I think this is, this is the thing, uh, the way I look at it, there will always be photography and filmmaking done by people in the way that we're, we've done it. Mm -hmm. but I think there's going to be in terms of work, there's going to be less, you know, yeah. Yep. And I think that's what's, that's the big change, you know? So say if you're an editor, right, a working editor that supports a family, people will eventually start using AI to edit simple things or mm -hmm. to do pre-edits, you know? So that's basically a smaller team of editors that you need to do a project, you yeah. know? Or like if you're a working photographer, some brands are going to start doing a lot of their social shit with just AI models, mm -hmm. you know? 
not they're not going to do everything with AI models, but they're going to start doing a lot with AI models, which means they're going to be hiring. It's not that they're not going to be hiring photographers. They're just going to be, going to be hiring less photographers. Mm -hmm. So there's still going to be in terms of these people that have these jobs, creative jobs, and those people are, you know, there's still going to be jobs. I just think there's going to be less, you know? Yeah. And I think that's, um, I think some jobs might just be totally eliminated. Some, you know, I mean, that's just, that's just how time works anyway. And just, you know, yeah. Certain jobs have always been eliminated. There's jobs, you know, people had 20 years ago that don't exist. That's just the way it goes. But I think in terms of what we do, that's just why I've been thinking about it is, you know, just because I do have kids. It's like, okay, you know, yeah, just trying to try to get an idea. I, I don't know what's going to happen. And you can get real dark and talk about <laughs> what's AI. the game. What's the game play, Greg? <laughs> well, no, you can. No, I'm saying you can get real dark and talk about what AI really could be. And that's a whole nother conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I think like, I'm just trying to kind of wrap my head around it in terms of like making sure that I'm kind of like just nimble. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, things are already hard, man. It's like so many people I know, you know, right now, at least in LA, there's like the economy, right? So a lot of these people that have in-house jobs are getting laid off. And there's no budgets for anything because mm -hmm. everyone's scared of the recession. All these big corporations and big brands are having to like basically slim down and fire a bunch of people and, and slow everything down. And then there's this writer strike going on, you know, yep. so that's like a lot of people aren't working. And then the non like the advertising stuff, you know, which doesn't require WGA and writers, like all the crew people and dps and everyone they're trying to get those jobs because everyone needs work you know <clears throat> so there's that going on um yeah and then there's also this sort of fear of like ai and where that's going i mean that's a big part of what the writer strike is about you know mm -hmm. i don't know if you've been following that but that's one of the things they want oh yeah make sure that there's no ai generated uh content you know and um which is really smart you know, and I think they're not going to back away from that. And that's why they're on. That's one reason why they're on strike. So it's a weird time, man. You know, yeah. it's like a weird time to be trying to kind of like survive as a person who makes stuff, you know, or is involved in film or photography or creative work, you know. I'm a I'm a glass half full guy, you know, I'm going to keep me too. Uh, keep, keep my eyes open, ears open. And uh, but yeah, just like keep making work. And yeah, like you said, I think you need to be, be able to be nimble and not have all, all your eggs in one basket and be open to doing stuff that maybe in the past you didn't think you would want to do, like whatever. And I don't yeah. know, just being open, because I think in the past, at least for me, I was too like narrow minded of like, this is the type of photographer I am. This is what I do. And yeah. it's like when I, I feel like when you're like that, you you kind of you don't allow stuff in. You're this kind of like, you know, mm hmm. Yeah, it's know. true. I think, and um, yeah, like it's, I don't know, man, I, I can't, I'm, I'm no expert on it, you know, no. yeah. but I look at it like almost like things, at least in my experience, whether it's like photography or filmmaking, things, roles have been become a lot blurrier, which could be a really good thing. You know, like literally when I started doing like commercials and ad work it was like oh yeah this person does like you know heightened doc style you know uh commercials this person does comedy you know and it's like and then that sort of all kind of got blurry and i think in photography too it's like photographers are now you know making films mm -hmm. and doing video or just kind of doing different types of work around their photography, whether it's like books or just visual storytelling of some different kind, because it's like, it's almost becoming a necessity that you, you know, can like at least explore what you do, you know, because yeah, things are changing. And I think kind of being stuck in one kind of mindset, which is, I mean, some people have a specific way they like to do stuff and that's their that's their form of expression and that's awesome mm -hmm. but i think in terms of like wanting to kind of like work and stay busy 
and keep making things and grow, I guess. Also, it's helpful, yeah, to kind of sometimes take a step back and be like, you know, like maybe it's okay to try some other stuff, you know, because you never know. And then you might try it and be like, yeah, I hate that. I don't want to ever shoot anything like that ever again. Now I know, you know, and that's sometimes the best, that's sometimes the best lesson too, you know, mm -hmm. it makes everything very clear. But I think like, yeah, I think you can look at it like, you know, I'm glass half uh, full too, you mm -hmm. know, like you can look at it like, man, there's so many opportunities to like, um, try new things and and to create different things you know it's like you can you can do uh especially with just how you can kind of reach a lot of people now yeah i mean i mean even just what you're doing like there's like podcasts there's i think about that stuff all the time like oh, i'd be awesome to do a podcast you know <laughs> yeah man and, it's um, an excuse to talk to people and it's i like... mean it's an excuse to talk to people and it's like opening up a thing in you that you know what I mean? Like this is I mean, you you have a podcast, so you know all about it. But I think sometimes like I'll think of an idea and I'd be like, wow, that'd be a cool podcast. I'd love to do something like that because or whatever, just try it. Cause that's what with yeah. this thing I started six years ago. And I was like, kind of like for a while, I was like, ah, I kind of want to do it. But then I was just like, eh, kind of a little self-conscious. I'm gonna sound like yeah. an idiot. And then I was just like, you know what? Fuck it. I just, I felt like in my it's like it's like intuition, like whatever. It could be a photo project, but it felt right. Like I was just like, I want to do this. I think that's yeah. like that's the thing with being creative. It's like whatever, trying stuff doesn't work. You don't gotta show it, you don't gotta do it anymore, but like just trying different stuff, shooting different stuff. I don't know. That's I how think I, it, I think it's really important. And and honestly, it's like um that's what this book is for me. You mm -hmm. know, it's like it it just I don't know how else to explain it. It's a very this this organic thing that happened and it is what it is. Like it doesn't it doesn't serve a purpose in terms of like me going to do other things or it's just something I made because I sort of had to make and I was like I'm just gonna make it you know yeah and like I you said like you said you before you never really kind of shown pictures of your family and like kids and that's kind of like a I mean that's a hard thing to do like being open to like your personal life and like sharing that with the world and yeah. like I don't, I don't know how that felt for you like finally putting it out there but i mean even that even that is like a different it's being create it's like a new creative way because you never put it out there before it's a different yeah. thing you've you never done you know and it's interesting because like one of the pictures in there that i was sort of it's it's one of the more the most personal pictures to me and one of the pictures where i was really also when i would try to look at it objectively would think like does this photo like, what is this photo? Like, what are, you know, in terms of the viewer who's looking at this book, like, what is this photo going to look or feel like? Doesn't even make any sense. And it's that photo of the bedside table. Yeah. That you said, and it's interesting I, that hearing you saying that, because like those two pictures that you mentioned, that's my mom in the hospital, you know, and there's, I shot a lot of her in the hospital and that's the one picture that I used um, for a lot of reasons. It's very representative of obviously her condition, but also um, my stepdad who's there with the sort of uh, blanket over him. Mm -hmm. But to me, it almost looks like a cape, you know, and um, without going into detail, it's very representative of like her situation and his situation and sort of his role or his perception of his role. And um there's sort of a quietness also to that picture, you know, um, and then the picture of the bedside table, that's actually my dad's bedside table on the day that he passed away. And, um, you know, it's interesting, like you go through all these pictures and you make this book and like that picture, when I sort of just, uh, whatever you want to say, auditioned it, or I put it into the edit and right away, I was like, yeah, this just kind of has to be in here. And then the picture after that is this picture of these two TV sets on top of each other, mm -hmm. you know, um, and that's actually Graceland. That's like Elvis's security cam security TVs at Graceland. But if you look in the actual frames in the bottom frame is a person taking a picture and there's a little kid sitting by themselves. 
And that is very representative of my relationship with my dad. And above that is a picture of this sort of like lone figure. So that picture is, when I saw that picture also, I was like, that's basically says so much about my relationship with my father. And that's sort of how that flow happened. I'm the only person, like I make this book, I'm the only person that knows that stuff. You know what I mean? And this is one reason why I enjoy, I'm okay with talking about it. I think the slideshows, especially because they're, those are private and more private. I can even open up more about that stuff. Um, it's really nice and the kind of therapeutic to talk about it. And I think people really enjoy hearing about kind of the, the personal side of why pictures were chosen, why they're in the order that they're in. But it's, it's interesting to hear that those are the two pictures that sort of resonated with you. Cause it's, it's my mom and my dad, oh, you know yeah. what I mean? And those are the only two pictures of them in the whole book, you know, this, this is what I take. I took away from the book. Maybe this is wrong. Uh, for the most part, I don't know the people in this book. Like I know Arto, that's about it. But everyone okay. else, I, I don't know these people. I don't, I don't know who they are. Yeah, I kind of viewed it as like since I did know there was like twenty years of pictures, it was kind of like and something I've been thinking about a lot more now that I'm getting older is like there's like people kind of come in and out of your life, and it's like they might be there for a while, and you have these relationships, and then maybe you're not as close as you used to be. And this is just me reading into the pictures. Maybe it's just my own mind, but it's like, they're kind of like, cause like some of the skaters I know, and you, you probably worked on them with projects and then even mm -hmm. the family stuff. And it's like, it's just kind of how like your life kind of transitions. And it's like mm -hmm. the, the chapters of your life and the and the people that come in and out of it. And that's how, that's what I kind of looked at, like in the pictures, looking at them. I don't know if that's inaccurate, but it's kind of, this the relationships in your life and this kind of the transition of them a little bit. I, I think, I think that's really accurate. You know, it's funny. I don't really have a, when I had to do a little summary of the book for super labo, I was like, shit, how do I even summarize this book? You know? <laughs> yeah. And it took me a long time to, to write it, you know, and to figure it out. Cause a lot of it was me trying to figure out how do I encapsulate what this book is? Because you know, that's kind of why I gave it the title. It's like, I can't even really explain, like you, you, you have your explanation for what I meant for you. And that's totally true. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I think what you said is really accurate. And there's so much more also for me and why certain pictures are in there. You know what I mean? Like, uh, it's just a, it's just sort of a feeling and a flow that ultimately after a lot of time, like months of sort of going through it, um, felt like it was done and it was right you know mm -hmm. um yeah so it, it is it's about i mean it's my life it's the things that are important to me a lot of the people that are important to me relationships that uh, that i've had friendships some very short some yeah. longer that i've had people that i've known that are no longer with with us you know mm -hmm. and how that affected me and how that affected a lot of people who knew them I mean, there's a lot of that in there. And I hopefully that's my thing when making this book is like, I was also careful just not to make it too heavy handed, you know, like for me putting Dylan reader in a book, I, I just, you know, because of how uh, special he was, you know, and how special his friendship is to me. I just always want to be careful not to like, to honor that, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So there is a lot in there about losing him too, you know, but I tried to, um, yeah, just kind of honor that and just make sure it was, didn't feel too like heavy handed, if that makes sense, you know? No, so. def yeah, definitely. That makes sense. And, uh, you know, one thing I was kind of curious about, like, obviously you were like a sponsored pro you're you you're a pro skater at one point like yeah for a, yeah, for a hot minute stereo was, yeah. stereo like what was mm -hmm. it tink tink camp folklore yeah, folklore yeah. days um yeah. i was just kind of curious like how your relationship with skateboarding has changed over the years like obviously you grew up a skate rat like myself and it's your life yeah. and all you do is skate and then you become like a filmmaker and you're filming skating like mm -hmm. what's it, like your relationship with skateboarding now is it still do you still love it the same way or is it different or i do but it's different you know 
what i don't know what what do i even compare it to you know marriage or something I don't, <laughs> I don't know it's like skateboarding was the first thing in my life that i ever like really fell in love with you know like i for from i don't know 13 to probably 20 or something like that i was 13 to 19 um i was like in love with skateboarding you know like yeah, i didn't yeah. i wasn't aware of that as a kid but it's just like all i thought about all i cared about i loved riding a skateboard so much i loved going skating so much i loved looking at the pictures i loved the videos i was like yep. truly in love with it you know and then yeah and that sort of like eventually got me out got me sponsored and got me out to california and um then you know, I think what I see now being on the other side, a lot of young people go through all of a sudden there's this pressure, you know, and you have eyes on you and you, so you can become really insecure, you know, and then all of a sudden this like pure thing where it's like, I'm just going to go skate with my friends behind the Kmart or whatever. All of a sudden there's like a photographer there or there's skaters there who you grew up watching and they're watching you. And it's like, you become really self-conscious my point is there becomes this thing in between you and your skateboarding. It's kind of like, you know, when you're a kid, you might be in, you're in a play and you rehearse the play a hundred times. Then all of a sudden you go on stage and it's like your head is like six feet away from your body and you're watching your body do these things. Yeah. You know, or, you know it's like being in a contest or something. It's this really strange um, experience for me. And maybe not for some people probably just get juiced off that, you know, <laughs> but, uh, I didn't. And, um, you know, I realized that I wasn't the most secure. I was pretty insecure. And uh, even though I'd kind of built this thing around me as a teenager in high school, I was very confident, you know, skated. And uh, I moved to California and I became very insecure. And, um, you know, it took me a long time to go pro. And that was hard. I feel like I sort of I didn't lose my spark for skating. I still love skating, but it's like I got really insecure. I mm -hmm. stopped skating as much. And then that sort of like fire, I don't know, I even know how to explain it. I was just kind of became disconnected from my skateboard, if that makes sense, you know? Yeah. And the progression slowed down and um, took me a long time to go pro. Eventually, I kind of got out of it in that sort of like tin can folklore period. And that's sort of when I started shooting pictures, you know? Mm -hmm. Um yeah but you know it wasn't i guess what i'm trying to say is like when i was a sponsored skater and even a pro skater it wasn't like the happiest time in my life you know and um uh but then like photography you know became and that's like the last book i did i kind of started taking I, as soon i took those photos on that trip and i came home and i saw them and like i was like as in love with photography as I was skateboarding like that's the second thing that I found in my life that I was like I just fucking loved it you know yeah. then I started going out taking photos at night walking around San Francisco streets like had my camera with me all the time Gabe Morford and I had a dark room I love photography and you know then that got me into like super eight and then cinematography so um and then and then in that time I got so sort of i was just not happy as a skateboarder so i just quit and, yeah and um and then i got pulled back into skating um making skate videos which is nothing i never i ever planned on and that was really strange for me you know because i had just been a pro skater like three years before and no, then all of a sudden i'm filming filmmaker. making videos and it was just an odd i don't know it was just a weird it wasn't bad you know, it was just something I never anticipated and something I had sort of had to adjust to. And, it's, you know, yeah. I, I'll be honest. It's like what I don't I love skateboarding. I like, you know, I watch skating. I look at skating every day on my phone. Mm -hmm. I watch a lot of the videos on Thrasher. You know, I'm still a fan of so many skaters. I'm, I'm the most I'm the biggest fan of the skaters from my time when I was young, you know, but mm -hmm. still I'm like. I'm into it, but I don't do it as much, you know, and, and me skating all the time, honestly stopped when I moved to LA and, um, partly because, uh, 
I had a job to do and it's like I wasn't there to skate. I was there to like film. And if and if no one's even filming a trick yet, I wanted to shoot some 16 or get some cool visuals. And that's sort of like that was my sort of MO. So I wasn't skating. I stopped skating a lot. Um, mm. But then also like when I go back to San Francisco still and I, I'm in a hotel or something and I'm like, I'm going to go get some food and I go skate on the street. I'm like that feeling comes back. I think it's just. Oh, yeah. There's something about skating in a city, you know, and being free on the street and riding a skateboard and grinding curbs that I that'll never go away. And I love L.A. as a city in a lot of ways. Um, That's why I'm raising my kids, but I'm not that motivated to skate here, you know, so I have to be, you know. That's that's where I'm at. You know, I, I'm not I'm not going to go skate every day because I need to hold on to some things. Exactly. That's what I was going to say is like I kind of went through this period because like you skateboarding is my life from like age 12 to like 21, 22. It's like all I did, all I thought about. And I kind of went through this period where I kind of felt like I was like, am I a fucking poser now? Because I don't skate like I used to like <laughs> 10 hours a day. Like I almost felt like yeah. guilty about it. Like I was like abandoning this thing. But then mm -hmm. I just realized it's just like the transition of your life. And it's like almost like going back to your book. It's like the chapters of your life. And it's like now I'm focused on my photography. And that's what gives me the passion. And it gives me excitement for what I'm doing now. And that's okay. Like I still love photography. Same, I mean, skateboarding, like you say, like I still look at Thrasher and the, the videos and it's still fun. But it's just it's not the same as it used to be. But it's still it's just different. Yeah, and, that, and that's okay. It's funny, man, because when I... uh moved into this place last year when i was going through all that stuff i just it's like this little two-bedroom apartment i live in with my kids mm -hmm. um they're here part-time and uh there's literally a skate spot across the street like a good one <laughs> i didn't know i didn't know about and i was like laying i was in bed one night and i could hear skaters right and i was like there's like and then maybe like a couple nights later i heard skaters again and i'm like there's like a skate spot next to my house i gotta go figure this out and i like walked across the street and there's like a really good skate spot and then i then i the next couple of days later i see on the other side of the street there's another skate spot <laughs> now i've realized that there's like honestly three or four like really good skate spots <laughs> right around my house so every once in a while actually i'll go especially yeah. the one across the street it's just these curbs i'll go and skate but nice i don't know man it's like also it's like i have two kids you know i have work responsibilities um, yeah, and, I, and that's not an excuse, but it's just sort of like um, I just don't have as much time, you know. So mm. I do think about skating a lot. I, I still have dreams. I don't know about you. I've oh yeah, dude. I'm like I'm like I, I'm ho I'm like a fidgeter, and I'm always I got this little like cap from I'm doing like little kickflips in my mind, this little goofy shit, you know. Um, yeah, I I have dreams that um, I have dreams a lot where I'm like. It probably says a lot about how I feel about <laughs> skating, but I have dreams a lot where I'm, um, I'm like me now, but I'm a pro skater and I'm like, and, but it's a dream. So it's kind of weird. I'll be like on, in, on a bus about to go meet people to go shoot or on, I, I'm a skater. I just have my board. I'm like still a pro skater, but I have like some, I had this dream recently where I had like these pants on these like like kind of dickies but they were too tight and i'm like oh man like i haven't been skating like what am i doing who am i fooling you know like i'm not i can't do this anymore so i still have <laughs> dreams That's as funny. as much as like i really i really don't look back a lot you know like i don't i like i like watching skating now of course i like watching the old things but i don't like I think it's because it wasn't it wasn't a bad time. I'm like so fortunate, you know, that I was able to kind of like be in the position I was and be around a lot of the people that I was at that time, like the Lux mm -hmm. in the mid 90s. I mean, it gave me so much in so many ways. Um, but also I wasn't it wasn't really the happiest time for me. So I'm not like yeah. sitting, sitting at home thinking about like, oh, man, I wish I could go back. You know, if anything, that time really taught me like, okay, you know, whatever I do in life, I need to really do it 100% and really kind of try to stay, stick with what I'm feeling and believe in myself, you know, because I think I didn't believe in myself when I was skating. And 
Um, so yeah, but I don't, yeah, in terms of my relationship with skating now, I, 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 I'm still really grateful to be a part of it and I'm still a huge fan of it. Um, I don't kind of dwell on a lot of what's happened up to now. I just really like kind of being in, yeah. in and what's not, going on now. So. Yeah. Yeah. All, lots of new exciting stuff you're working on. And like, that was the other thing. A few more questions. I'll let you go. Uh, sure. it is what, what kind of work excites you now? Like, cause is like, is filming like the act of skateboarding still excite you? Um, cause like looking at some of the cool projects you're doing now, it's a lot more like storytelling. Like I said, like the thing yeah. with Lizzie and then you did a cool uh, project yeah. with, with Jeff Riley for Yeti. Um, yeah. in terms, in terms of your work, what kind of stuff are you excited with, with like filmmaking these days? I mean, I really like, so I don't shoot a lot of skateboarding now sort of for a bunch of reasons, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I didn't for a long time. And then I worked on that. All right. Okay. Video where I actually was out shooting skating every day. And that was really fun. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just different with kids. I have to coordinate it now. Shooting skating is sort of like being a detective or something. You're just like always on the case, you know, yeah. it's like, we're going to Riverside, you know? Okay. Yeah. So you have to just be able and nimble to just go anywhere at any time, or even go up to, you might one morning be hanging out. You might go drive up to like skate the hubba and, Palo Alto it's like a five-hour drive I mean that's the type of things we used to do you know yeah um so I'm not doing that anymore and I'm not really shooting skating as much unless it's for like a specific project so yeah I think what excites me is um I really like storytelling I really like always trying something new that's important for me you know um and I also I just like to really I don't know I think uh in in like kind of capturing people and that type of storytelling, I like to really kind of just bring the most out of it, you know? And sometimes that might be the cameras that you use or just really thinking through like, how are we gonna like execute this, you know? Like, how can we really make this like sing, you know? Instead of like we're prior, you know, years past, it might be like, okay, this is a film project, let's, this is what we need to do. Now it's a little bit more like, how can I really like push it and try to like really make this thing really sing, you know? For, so for example, like with that Rolly thing, it was like, let's shoot Jeff, but let's try to get like, to be smart about it, not do like this eight days. Let's maybe just try to do it in a few days and condense it and use Steadicam, you know, and good sound and have a crew and really kind of shoot Jeff and his element, but do it in like an elevated way that feels really different for how you've seen him in the past, you know? Um, and how so do you, how do you approach those projects? Cause is it like, you're like storyboarding everything because a lot of it, it, it is still his true words. It's like not scripted, but are you yeah, kind of like I, coaching him on like what you want him to say no. or like, nah. No, I think, you know, to be honest, and this isn't a lot of times it's out of necessity. I mean, I've been sort of pushing away from doing talking head interviews, mm -hmm. you know, not that I don't like talking head interviews, but I think they need to be shot really well for them to work. And then also you're just seeing a head come up in the film and it, so you have to kind of work around that. Um, so I think starting actually around the Jeff project and then that Lizzie project sort of followed in that way. And then the Zion where I just like to sit down with the person and just talk, you know, and you can talk for two hours and you can talk for two hours on two or three different occasions. And then you go through that and you find the little bits that really, I feel like are true to that person and resonate. And I think by not having a camera in their face and not having the limitations of having lighting and crew and having to stop for things and just being able to have a conversation with someone, you can really get to the core of that person, you know, and then you kind of build these visuals up around it, you know? So that's, yeah, that's the Jeff actually did. Jeff's thing did have a little bit of talking head in it now that I'm thinking of it, but not much, but, but there was a lot of off camera, like just him and I sitting in his car talking, you know, and um, the how do you, Lizzie, how, how do you the, make people? Yeah. Like, how do you, because obviously some people are comfortable in front of the camera. Some people are not. And I'm sure maybe some of the projects you're working on, like you don't really know the people that well. So, and you're yeah. just get thrown into it. Like, 
how do you approach that aspect of it? Like sticking a camera in someone's face and you still got to make compelling work. <laughs> it's hard. Um, and I will say that some people are just natural mm-hmm. and some people aren't, you know, and you have to work around that. <clears throat> That's the main thing. Uh, and you have to try, you know, because I've learned that sometimes the people who you don't even anticipate being a big part of a project, just they are just like what they give you is so much more than you ever imagined. And then sometimes the sort of like hero people that you really want, you're like writing in like, okay, this person's going to be like key because they've had this crazy history and they're amazing storytellers for whatever reason. It just doesn't work. That just doesn't work. You just never know. So I feel like you just, you have to try. And then when you have the people who aren't really comfortable, you just have to make them comfortable, you know, and you have to just try to talk to them kind of get, as you're going through the interview, get a feeling of kind of like what's working and what's not working. And you have to kind of be very nimble and, um, you know, make, make, just try to make, make the best of it. Um, but I feel like the off camera interview, it just provides something really nice, you know, like uh, with that Lizzie film, like my idea was, was like, we're just going to interview people that are very close with her. We don't want we're not going to hear Lizzie talk. Yeah. Everyone's heard Lizzie talk and she's also very quiet, you know? So let's have the people that are close to closest to her talk about her. And then we'll just spend three days with her and we'll shoot it all on 35, you know, mm-hmm. instead of like, spending you know five or six days sitting down with all these people you know let's just spend a few days where we're just kind of capturing lizzie as she is but on 35 with a steady cam i know i had this kind of i i was like and it's also sort of a little bit of a hail mary you're like hopefully this is going to work you know but um with that we interviewed a bunch of people and her mom just like was amazing you know like what she said and how she said it just had so much like resonance to me, you know, and then just seeing Lizzie doing her thing in a very beautiful way, you know, shot on film with her mom talking about how special she is just really, it was, uh, it just, it just worked. And then same with the Zion thing. Like um, I'd never met Mustafa, his dad, you know, maybe briefly I'd said hi to him. He was great. But I interviewed Zion. I, we interviewed several people for that. And his dad was just like, you just hear that voice and you're like, okay, you know, it's so um, I don't know, all those, all those were sort of like, you know, trying something a little bit different and trying to dig a little bit. I think, I think I do really just like um, capturing people as they are, you know, like, I think like sometimes just pictures, I think it honestly goes way back to when I was a kid and I was a skateboarder. And this is before your time, but um, you might be familiar with it. Like Transworld would have like photo annuals. Oh, yeah. So um, there'd be pictures in the photo annuals of like, you know, Neil Blender driving in his Volvo or like Nottis and Jim Thebo, like laying in the grass laughing. Um, And it's like seeing these people just as they are, you know, candidly you know like neil driving in his volvo i'd be like whoa he's in a volvo like that's his car you know (laughs) because you back then you never saw that stuff you know no and i think that's still you know that's what i sort of kind of in my photography i kind of try to achieve sometimes i like seeing really just getting a sense of the person for who they are out of sort of outside of what everyone kind of knows them for like the real candid person maybe in a situation that, you know, in a very more of a candid environment, you know? And I think for filmmaking too, I really, I just love that. I, I mean, personally, and, and it might not, some people might not find it as interesting, but just like, just like seeing Lizzie on a walk with Axel to me is like really sick, you know, because that's mm-hmm. what they do, you yeah. know? And it's like, you don't have to have some crazy, super interesting scenario that's exciting sometimes just really truly seeing people as they are for me can be the most interesting you know so um, that, that's right suck on that ai you can't touch that man <laughs> <laughs> no ai will then do it way better they'll, no. come with, they'll come up with like 
Yeah, I don't know. But <laughs> no, no, no. It's the, it's the authenticity. But Greg, uh, can't thank you enough for coming back on the podcast. It's always a pleasure talking to you. And definitely everyone listening, I think uh, you go go pick up a copy of his book, Everything I'm Trying to Tell You. Uh, I'll put the link in the description, Super Labo yeah. and other places. But uh, yeah, yeah, can't thank you enough, Greg. Of course. And uh, a lot of people message me about the book because you can buy it from Super Labo. Shipping is a little bit more expensive, but the book is actually a little bit less. So it's actually not that much more. Yeah. And their shipping is really nice. And um, it's in yen, but don't like freak out about that because it charges you in dollars yeah You're not i got it, i got it in two days i was amazed from japan yeah. I, I showed up in two days uh which which was incredible so definitely go pick up a copy yeah uh, but... yeah and then that um if anyone's listening and if they're in that out that way yeah, june 3rd at baltimore photo space i think that should be really cool i'm i've never met kyle in person but i've always been a fan of just his photography and him as a dude and Mm. Um, one thing that's been really fun about this book is doing stuff at bookstores you know independent bookstores i think it's really fun and exciting to support that stuff so oh yeah well thanks okay. again greg yeah alex perfect thank I'll you man it. i'll end it there so there you have it that was the greg hunt interview uh just want to thank greg so much for taking the time to come back on the podcast uh, it was a real pleasure catching up with him and talking to him about his new book um really uh powerful images in the book really uh personal images and uh, obviously the amazing skate stuff that he's documented for years, but just uh, uh, really great to talk to him about his process and um, how he approached working on this book. Um, like I said, it's available for purchase now at superlabo.com. Um, definitely recommend picking up a copy. Uh, I got mine last week, really enjoyed it. Um, I'll put the link in the description if you want to go grab a copy. Uh, but yeah, as always, uh, thanks so much for listening and take care.